Hey, how you doing? This is Adam Post, publisher of more than a thousand comic books and marketing expert covering Disney loses the narrative as Nelson Peltz takes the lead in the hostile takeover. Let's get into the story. Before we do, please be sure you are subscribed to the channel. Click the bell for notifications. Give me a thumbs up. I really appreciate you guys. The voting has started for Nelson Peltz to try to get onto the board of directors of Disney. According to the Wall Street Journal, Nelson Peltz is ahead of another board member, making it look like he's got a pretty good chance of getting on the board. It's not all the votes. They still have days worth of voting left, but it does look very positive. And it's important to remember, even if Nelson Peltz did not win a seat on the board of directors of Disney, he might still get one anyway. It happened before. From pensions and investments, Procter & Gamble awards Nelson Peltz a board seat after narrowly losing proxy vote. It was the same kind of hostile proxy fight to try to get a seat on the board, to try to have influence over the company, and he didn't win that fight. But it was clear that the major investors, institutional investors, a large percentage of individual investors, did actually support Nelson Peltz because the guy's brilliant. He's a self-made billionaire. He's been in this kind of business for decades. He's added a lot of value to companies. And all he does is he sits as a representative on a board of directors and asks the other board members, as well as important managers like Bob Iger, why are you making the decisions you're making? What are your strategic plans? When you go and invest a billion dollars, for example, like with Epic Games, like Disney just did, what is your respected return on investment for the shareholders of Disney? Was it just a press release? Was it just a careless thing where you're just gonna throw them a billion dollars? When are the products going to come out? Similarly, he very provocatively said in an interview recently, why do I have to have all female characters in a Marvel movie? Why all female Marvels? Why do I need an all black cast if I'm going to do Black Panther? Nelson Peltz is great at asking these strategic questions. And the answer to the strategic questions is not something Bob Iger wants to give up. But institutional investors like these kinds of questions. Sure, a lot of them are into the diversity, equity, and inclusion thing. They understand that. Some of them even still support ESG. But even major institutional investors have begun pulling back on their support for DEI-based proposals. For example, institutional investors did not support a plan to give executives of Starbucks compensation and bonuses based on their hiring and promotions of DEI agendas. The institutional investors were the ones that voted that down. And Peltz has been getting support from them. So even if he doesn't get on the board of directors, he's not going to be done with the company. When he first had a run at Disney to join their board of directors, after he didn't go forward, he didn't get on their board of directors, but Disney did make a lot of changes, I did a video saying Peltz is not done. And Peltz was not done. He was keeping an eye on the situation, and since that time, Ike Perlmutter was fired from Disney and then joined with Peltz. It would be a mistake to think, even if Peltz doesn't get on the board right now, that he's not going to go forward with pushing Disney and publicly asking very aggressive questions as if he was on the board of directors. Also keep in mind, there's another major player involved. We saw a 50-page complaint letter get filed by America First Legal with the board of directors and the CEO of Disney. And this is not just a, I'm angry at you letter, stop acting the way you're acting letter. This is the bare bones structure of a very serious lawsuit. Whether or not Peltz gets on the board of directors, I'm expecting this to be filed as a lawsuit soon. A month prior, America First Legal filed a federal civil rights complaint against Disney for illegal race and sex discrimination, which is incorporated somewhat into this letter, but this letter is much more than that. This letter is 25 pages of citation after citation of where the board of directors has not been following their fiduciary duties, of where Disney is conducting unlawful contracting practices, taking political actions on behalf of the company that they have no business doing, they have no authority to do, not disclosing to investors what they're doing and why they're doing it, not protecting employees from illegal hiring practices. It goes on and on and on and on with multiple, multiple citations. And then there are multiple pages of attachments. And they don't just do this for fun. They get results at America First Legal. This is from Bloomberg. Trump advisor Stephen Miller's legal group rakes in $44 million. 
America First Legal's revenue jumped 600% according to tax filings. Their group is part of a nonprofit network tied to Donald Trump. And why would they get an extra 600% in funding for their nonprofit? Because their legal group gets results. From the New York Times, America First Legal, a Trump-aligned group, is spoiling for a fight. The group headed by former Trump advisor Stephen Miller has filed more than 100 legal actions against woke companies and others. But winning may be beside the point because these companies make changes because they're forced to make changes when they get called out for doing illegal things. The DEI stuff, dedicating their entire business strategy to pushing political agendas and radical ideologies, they can't legally do that. They can do it, but when they get sued over it, they have to answer for it. And it stops the behavior. Other projects from Stephen Miller, from Bloomberg, why companies are scaling back DEI in America, they've got a picture of him. It's because of what he's doing. He's taking on the NFL Rooney Rule, which is a rule that if you're hiring for a management position, you need to include at least a certain number of diversity potential candidates. And that kind of quota approach to hiring is actually not legal. And it goes on and on. Stephen Miller doesn't stop. It's a very powerful, effective group. And even The Hollywood Reporter just had a major feature, Bob Iger's Invincible Era is over. After a major Wall Street firm sides with activist Nelson Peltz ahead of an April 3rd shareholders meeting, investors are questioning how the CEO plans to plot out growth and his succession. The lack of a succession plan at Disney is the thing that will be the undoing for Bob Iger. Bob Iger can't name a successor. He already named Bob Chapek. He thought Bob Chapek would just follow his lead and Bob Chapek would do what Bob Iger wanted. Didn't work out that way. And Bob Chapek was not qualified to stay at Disney. He did have a lot of skills, but he made some major mistakes. And even though Bob Iger put him in a bad position, the position he was in, he could not handle. He actually lost the Reedy Creek District in Florida, the essentially private government that Disney owned with its theme parks. He blew that deal. It just got settled the other day. Now, on the voting taking place from the Wall Street Journal, Disney try and blitz shareholders for votes in last stretch of proxy fight. On casting votes, many of the company's largest institutional shareholders, such as BlackRock and Vanguard, have yet to cast their votes and often wait until closer to the deadline. Individual investors are expected to have outside sway, given that they hold a more than one-third of the shares. And that's a big number, but when you look at the number of shares held by institutional investors, institutional investors hold 67%. That's where the two-third part is. So this really will probably be decided by institutional investors. So far, a minority of shareholders have voted. As of Tuesday, just over 22% of shares have been cast, according to people familiar with the matter, the bulk of them held by individual and other small investors. Among those who have already cast their votes, Nelson Peltz leads Disney director Maria Elena Lago Bacino, while Jay Rizzullo, the former CFO, on Nelson Peltz's try-in slate, has so far failed to gain much of a foothold with shareholders, according to those people. Although the institutional investors may really like the idea of putting the old CFO back on the board of directors as well as Nelson Peltz, because he knows where all the bodies are buried, he knows the company very well, and he can ask the management team a lot of important questions about their accounting practices. And the accounting practices at Disney really should be looked at very carefully. A spokesman for Disney said leaking an early vote count was a highly inappropriate attempt to sway votes. So they're not disputing that Peltz is ahead. Most shareholders are able to vote or alter a previous vote until the polls are officially closed, which happens the day of the annual meeting. This was a huge boost to Nelson Peltz and was a big surprise to people watching the proxy battle. In a setback for the Disney board, influential shareholder firm ISS backs Nelson Peltz in proxy fight. ISS, which recommends how institutional investors should vote, says that the Disney's failed succession process are key to its recommendation. It's impossible to exaggerate how important it is that a company has a clearly defined strategy with a CEO who seems like they can carry out that strategy. That's the narrative. That's the future of the company. That's where the growth is going to come from. So when you ask like, well, what's Bob Iger's plan for growth? What's the future CEO who we don't even know who that person might be? What's his plan going to be for growth? We don't know because Bob Iger hasn't outlined a strategy. This was also a really strange piece. Disney put out a few weeks ago how much money they made from Star Wars and Marvel franchises. From Hollywood Reporter, this is how much Disney has made off the Star Wars and Marvel franchises. They claim to have made a three to one return on what they spent to buy the companies. 
over the past 15 years. And that sounds like an argument that you would make to institutional investors to say, look, we're such a great company that when we spend a billion dollars, it comes back as a three to one return and we still own the properties. Like, okay, yeah, that's fine about what you did 15 years ago up until now, but what are you doing with the properties now? Why is it that people that used to love Marvel and used to love Star Wars don't seem to love them anymore? Yes, you've made them more diverse, but have you really added value to these franchises? It doesn't seem like it. And investors aren't dumb. That's why Nelson Peltz can ask these really pointed questions and force Disney management and other board members to have to come up with some kind of answer. They have responded to Peltz's questions, but they haven't really had a clear response. They essentially just insult him again and again. And he's been insulted before. He's been called a lot of things. I don't think he's got a problem with that. But the Disney board does have a problem with that, especially once America First Legal files their lawsuit. It's going to be a massive lawsuit when they file it. They haven't said they're going to file a lawsuit. I'm just suggesting America First Legal knows what they're doing and having covered a lot of other stories before about how federal complaints are often kind of a warning and a prerequisite to a civil lawsuit and seeing how America First Legal has already done that with a federal complaint and already done that recently with this massive filing, I would be very surprised to not see a lawsuit come out of this. And one thing America First Legal asked Disney to do specifically that I have a feeling they're not going to do is this, distribute a copy of this letter to all shareholders in advance of the shareholder meeting on April 3rd, 2024. I could be wrong. We'll see what's going to happen. But all the board members got this letter as well. This has been in the media and people are talking about this. Hoarding shareholders. Disney and Tryon continue to dart around the U.S., making their final cases for why shareholders should back their nominees in what has become a tight race. Iger has personally visited major shareholders in recent weeks, while senior executives, including finance chief Hugh Johnston and Alexia Quadrani, executive vice president of investor relations, have met with others. In some cases, Disney's board members, including chairman Mark Parker and Lago Messino, who is known as Mel and one of the board members whose seat Tryon is contesting, have also attended shareholder meetings. So Disney is really reaching out, trying to change people's minds. They know there's a great chance they've lost this battle with Pelts. But even if they don't lose this one battle with Pelts, they have already lost the war. They're not going to get away with not answering questions about strategy and all the issues raised by the America First legal letter, accusing them of illegal hiring practices, pushing political ideologies to the detriment of the shareholders, not even warning shareholders that they were pushing political ideologies and that it's being done at shareholders' own personal expense especially with the stock down by 40% from the last couple of years, Bob Iger and the rest of the Disney board are going to have to answer for that, no matter what happens. Disney has told investors in private meetings that it would be problematic and disruptive for the company and Iger if Peltz joins the board and that his presence in the boardroom would slow down decision-making. It has also talked about the company's streaming strategy and focus on revitalizing its studio. Peltz and his team, which includes his son Matthew Peltz, a partner at Tryon, and another young partner, Ryan Bunch, have made dozens of shareholder visits, including trips to Canada and the UK. Some large shareholders have received multiple visits. Some major institutional investors are still undecided because they say both sides have made valid points. Bob Iger really hasn't made any valid points. Nelson Peltz is a billionaire shareholder of Disney stock. He controls around $3.5 billion worth of stock. There is not one major shareholder who is on the board of directors of Disney asking them questions about what are you doing with my stock? What are you doing with my shareholder investment? Bob Iger is saying, well, you know, that would be problematic and disruptive to have somebody on there asking me all these questions. Like, well, it's only problematic if you don't have a legitimate answer for those questions. And he doesn't. And whether it's Nelson Peltz or the Peltz movement, they're going to win. While Iger is viewed as a strong CEO, some see value in having an outside voice to raise questions and challenge opinions in the boardroom. Several investors said Disney's addition of former Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman to its board was a good sign of its commitment to succession, given the smooth leadership transition he oversaw at his bank last year. I'm sure that was very smooth. The issue, though, is the bank really probably didn't change their business very much. Disney's business needs to change how they handle their intellectual properties, how they treat their customer feedback, 
but also how they're going to handle distribution as the entertainment industry continues to evolve. Some investors say they've considered the possibility that Iger might step down from the board should Peltz or Rizzullo win a seat. I think it's very likely that Iger would step down from the board and step down from the company even early. He may not step down from the board immediately. He'll step down from the board before he would leave the company. But I wouldn't be surprised to see him leaving as soon as 2025, not just the board, but the whole company. Because he can't answer the questions that Nelson Peltz is going to ask him. And they're very direct, straightforward questions. And the answers to those questions, if he was going to answer truthfully, is look, it's more important to me to change the world than it is to make a profit for my shareholders. It's more important for me to push my personal ideological views and advance them than it is to deliver for what our customers actually want. The old family values approach has now been replaced with radical Marxist sexualized content. That's what Bob Iger would have to say. He's going to leave the company before he says it. People will say it about him after he's left, but he's not going to admit it like a man. Iger would be the first person to tell you that the business he's running today isn't the same business he was running years ago, said Michael Cugino, president and a portfolio manager for the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds, a small Disney shareholder. Quote, if he decides to leave, maybe it's a so what? The two largest and most influential proxy advisory firms were split in their recommendations to shareholders. Glass Lewis advised investors to vote in favor of Disney's board nominees, while Investor Shareholder Services recommended that shareholders vote to add Peltz to the board, but not Rizzullo, and support all but one of Disney's nominees. A third and less well-known proxy advisor, Egan Jones, weighed in on try Insight on Tuesday, enumerating concerns it had about Disney's current management and board, including the lack of a long-term succession plan, weak financial performance, and distracting forays into, quote, the killing fields of the culture wars, among others. That's a nice way to say the killing fields of the culture wars, but yeah, Disney went in full bore all into the culture wars and turned shareholders' properties as a weapon against normal American culture. And the result has been a 40% drop in their stock price, no clear strategy for the future that would benefit shareholders, and no CEO when Bob Iger even leaves. Disney delivered a blockbuster first quarter earnings report for February, packed with announcements, including a plan to take an equity stake in Fortnite maker Epic Games, with which Pelt said, hey, okay, but since you're spending shareholder money in an equity investment in Epic Games, how are we going to get a return on investment from that? Should we just hang out or did you have some kind of a plan? Are you going to have Disney products in these Epic Games? And if you are, like, when are you rolling out the products? And by the way, what's the plan for that? No plan, no plan. Disney also claimed it's on track to make its streaming business profitable by the end of September, a top priority for many shareholders, and in a rare departure from past years, provided guidance for profit expectations going forward, saying earnings per share are likely to increase 20% for the year. However, Iger told colleagues before the earnings announcement that he expected the positive announcements to serve as a kind of knockout punch to Triant's proxy campaign, keeping in mind that Bob Iger is so desperate to stop anyone from asking him questions while they're on the board of directors at Disney because he has no legitimate answers for any of those questions, that he coordinates all of these events, all of these announcements, all of these investments, all on behalf of shareholder money that's financing all of this, in addition to laying off thousands of people, in addition to bringing in Hugh Johnston, the CFO formerly of Pepsi, because the guy had experience in fighting off Nelson Peltz when Peltz was trying to get on the board of Pepsi. Bob Iger did all of that to try to stop Nelson Peltz. It's like Nelson Peltz is good and Bob Iger is evil and evil is trying to block out the good. I've never seen such an attempt to prevent someone who obviously, because they're a major shareholder, should be on the board of directors, particularly because there's no one else who is a major shareholder who's on the board of directors of Disney. I've never seen such an effort to keep someone off the board of directors. And it's not like Nelson Peltz has gone and blown up anybody else's company ever in the past. And you know that's true because if it was true, of course, Bob Iger and Disney would be saying that nonstop. They don't say that. People who have spoken to Iger in recent weeks have described him as confident and happy with the direction of the company. He told one associate that he's confident Disney will prevail. Disney, the company, will prevail. Bob Iger's control of Disney and his blocking out of investors, major investors, joining the board of directors to just ask questions about the strategy of the company and how the company is investing and spending the investors' money, that is not going to prevail. Whether it's Nelson Peltz getting on the board this time 
or the lawsuit from America First Legal or five or 10 other actions. What Bob Iger has been doing is not sustainable. And now we're about to see some major change. Let me know what you think of all this in the comments below. Always love to see your ideas. Please be sure you are subscribed to the channel. Click the bell for notifications. Give me a thumbs up and I'll see you again soon with another story. And if I don't see you, I will miss you.